So this morning we're going to be covering uh, Philippians chapter 3. We're starting in Philippians chapter 3. This is session 13 in Philippians. And uh, we're going to be covering verses 1 through 7. So we'll start by reading over it, and then we will start to take it apart. So Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, we read, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. So this is a passage that I think uh, all of us are going to be able to relate to because at the end of the day, we all have to make that decision whether we're going to have confidence in the flesh or whether we're going to rejoice in Christ Jesus and worship God in spirit and, you know, count lost all the things of this world, lay them down at the feet of Jesus. You know, it's easy when we're young in our faith to be very zealous, but that's why the Bible describes it almost reverse, right? He said, we run, we, we, we got the wings of eagles, you know, we run and we're not wearied and then we walk and we don't faint because it's easy when you're soaring, right? It's easy when you're running, but the Christian life is a walk and that walk is a difficult thing because it's faithfulness, it's endurance, it's persevering and continuing on in Christ Jesus and not allowing, like we see with the four soils, the parables of the soils, the, it comes in and the desires of this world, the desire for other things, the desire for riches, persecution, whatever it may be, comes in and it chokes the word. Notice it's God's word that he uses to bring about that sanctification like we read in John 17, 17, right? Sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. But the enemy brings all these distractions and all these kinds of things, and it's very difficult. And one of the main things he does is to make us convinced, to convince us that it's a works-based thing, that you can be accepted if you try really hard, if you do really good, if you have works plus faith, like the Catholic Church teaches, for instance. But at the end of the day, our works, the Bible tells us, are as filthy rags. And you guys, I think most of you who've been a Christian know the term there. It's not a pleasant one. It's uh, not safe for work, let's say. But it's, it's nothing that God wants. Is God impressed by the things that we do to impress him when he says our works are as filthy rags? Definitely not. What he wants is faith. He wants us to trust in him. He wants us to rejoice in him, have no confidence in the flesh, and to worship Christ in spirit and in truth, not just you know outwardly, but in our spirits, in our hearts, pouring out our hearts before the Lord. So I think this is a message that will really be applicable to us as Christians. So let's start with verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. You know, uh, as most of you guys know, I uh, was sent out as, our family was sent out as church planting missionaries from the, the Calvary Chapel Bible College years ago. And so I used to often go to Calvary Chapel pastors' conferences and we would joke that when you're at these conferences, it's a bunch of men who know the answers, reminding each other of the answers that we already know. You know, and that's often what it is. It's reminding ourselves of these things that we already know. And that is so much of the Christian life because like we talked about, the Christian life is an endurance walk, right? In, in the wilderness, in this occupied land, in the whole world, and half the church is like, hey, let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to the world. And we're like, no, we're going to the promised land, man. We're, we're walking in through the desert. It's hard. It's not easy. And the temptations of Egypt lie behind us. But no, we want to continue walking. We want to continue to persevere and seek the Lord's face. I only have a couple jokes, as you guys know. I don't have a lot of stories and a lot of jokes because, believe it or not, God has so many stories, he gave us a whole book full of stories. So I think his stories are just fine. But I do have a joke, and if you guys have been with us for a while, you probably heard it. You know, there's a, a, a church, and they hire a new pastor, 
And, you know, the pastor gets up there on the first Sunday and he preaches this message, right? He knocks it out of the park and, you know, the elder board or whatever is like, man, all right, he's we, a good pick, right? He's, he's doing pretty good. This is amazing, right? And then he gets up there that second week and he preaches the same message again. And then the elders are just like, huh, well, it was a good message. So, yeah, okay, that was kind of weird, but I'm pretty sure that was the same message as last week, almost certain. And then he gets up there on the third week and he preaches the same message again. And at this point, they're like, we got to do something. This is getting ridiculous. So afterwards, they confront him and the pastor says, I just figured I'd keep preaching it until you guys start doing it. Because the reality is we hear these things and, you know, especially coming from a Calvary Chapel background where we have such a, an illustrious history of verse by verse teaching and just really digging in deep to God's word. Uh, but the problem in America that we see with the, the solid, we'll say the solid biblical churches is not that people don't know enough. It's that they don't put into practice what they know. Right. It's an academic thing. And they can tell you everything that they need to know about the Bible and they can explain it all to you. And oh, it's so good. But they're not living it out. And at the reality of the at the reality of the situation is if you're just hearers of the word and not doers of the word, then you're deceiving yourselves. Your faith's dead, right? What do you get when you have a a body of water that has all input and no output. There's no outlet. There's no flowing out of there. You get the Dead Sea, right? Where everything just floats into there and it just sits there and putrefies. And that's so often what we see in churchianity and popular Christianity today, where people know so much, but they do so little with it. You know, I've talked to many people who have been on the mission field and the, the observation that the average American Christian who is of a solid Bible teaching background, like a Calvary Chapel or a Bible church or what have you, they usually know more than the average pastor in the third world. And they do almost nothing with it. And they don't live it out. And they just got all this knowledge bouncing around between their ears. And what they do with it is slim to none. And how tragic is that, guys? That's the last thing that we want to be. We want to be living this out. And obviously, nobody likes to be told the same thing over and over and over. Nobody likes to be nagged at, right? And yet, as any parent knows, there are some things in this life that bear repeating. There's things that are worth repeating. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. You always get a kick out of parents that are like, I don't force my kids to go to church, you know? I'm like, do you force them to brush their teeth? What do you think is more important in light of eternity? You're like, I force them to brush their teeth, but not to get right with God. That sounds like that makes zero sense at all, but I can tell you who loves that, and it's not Jesus. You know, we're supposed to train up a child in the way of the Lord so that when he's old, he won't depart from it. And there are some things that in life, they bear repeating, you know? We don't say these things to be annoying. We say these things to protect our kids because a nine-year-old with dentures isn't too cool, right? So we want our kids to brush their teeth. We want our kids to take showers lest they get like trench foot, like it's World War I or something. It's like, no, you have to have hygiene. And that's the same kind of point that Paul is here making. It's not annoying for me to repeat myself. I say this to protect you guys. That's kind of like the paraphrase of what Paul's saying. He's like, yeah, I know I'm repeating myself a lot, huh? Yeah, that's because I love you guys. I'm trying to protect you guys. And I think we all get that kind of concept, right? When something's really important, we should make sure people have a clear grasp of it. You know, I always get confused when I hear uh, people deceived by these things that the Bible never mentions, there's so much in popular Christianity and denominational Christianity that the Bible never says, you know, like having a pope or that men in ministry remain celibate or baptizing babies or purgatory. I always joke, imagine something so important that God totally forgot to mention it. Because you look at all these denominations, these beliefs, all these different uh, sects of Christianity and the like. And they're really, really focused on things the Bible totally forgot to mention, which flies in the face of exactly what we're reading here. Paul's like, hey, this is so important. I'm going to repeat it again and again. And yet half of more than, let's be honest, more than half of Christianity is like, this thing is so important. And you're like, wow, that's weird. The Bible says absolutely nothing about it. That's really important. Yeah. Or Satan distracted them and deceived them and diverted them and got them off in left field. Yeah, guys ever play Little League? If 
you play Little League or have kids that have played Little League or soccer, you ever play a sport when you're a little kid? You ever see those parents that are super eager and they got their four-year-old out there? And their four-year-old has no idea what they're doing. They're just like picking flowers and, you know, they're just playing with bugs. When I've had, you know, my kids play sports and they're too young, that's exactly what you see, right? You see that kind of thing going on where they're, the kids have no idea what they're doing out there, right? They're just like a butterfly, wow, a ladybug, like a flower. You're like, yeah, the team just scored like a bunch on you guys because you're playing in the dirt. You know, we've seen kids sitting down like playing in the grass. They're like, what are you, what are you doing? That's kind of what half of Christianity is doing right now. You know, we're in this game and it's life and death, right? Souls are in the balance. And yet half of Christianity is like, hey, a butterfly, wow. But no, God tells us very clearly what we need to focus on. And it's not these things that are so important that God forgot to mention them. It's the things that he repeats again and again and again. And that's why Paul's like, yeah, this is so important that I'm going to repeat it again and again. And if something's important, we're going to hammer it home. I think we understand that. That's pretty common sense. It makes sense. And before we get into what's so important that Paul doesn't mind repeating it, look at how verse 1 begins, because I think this is important. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And now from this, we see two things. Number one, we see that Paul is super ambitious. He's very optimistic because here he's saying finally, and we are literally halfway through the letter, but he's like, I'm wrapping it up, guys, as he is halfway through the book. But that's adorable, right? Paul's like, finally, guys. And then also we see that Paul wants us to rejoice in the Lord. And that sounds, you know, kind of kind of quaint, kind of trite, right? But it's actually hugely important, and here's why. Our collective tendency as humans, church, is to rejoice when things go our way. You know, you if you're on social media, you'll see people rejoicing over the dumbest kind of things ever. Like I got all green lights on the way to work. Like I'm having a great day. You're like, what? You know, or yeah, I got a raise at work or I, you know, I aced that exam. Yeah. And I'm not saying those things aren't great. I'm just saying that those things shouldn't be the only cause for our rejoicing because none of those things have even remote importance in light of eternity. Not even a little. Do you think in eternity you're going to think how you got all green lights on your way to class that one day? You're like, remember that day, man, 6,000 years ago? This is, I got all green lights on the way to work. My favorite song came on in the elevator. Like, wow, wow, that's amazing, man. In the truest sense, these things don't really matter that much, right? I mean, if we're going to be honest, that we, we all understand that. And if we rejoice only when things go our way in the petty, mundane, terrestrial sense— then we will be petty and mundane and focused on the terrestrial, focused on the carnal, the here and now, instead of focusing on the spiritual reality that underpins our existence. Who do you think likes that? Who do you think would love nothing more than for us to be focused on and delighting in these things that don't matter at all? Hint, not God. And if we want to be useful to God and impacting the world for Jesus, then we need to rejoice in the Lord rather than in the things that are irrelevant or worse yet, contrary to what God's eternal purposes are. So Paul doesn't mind driving home the same points and warnings again and again and again because he knows it's for our own good. He says it's safe for him to remind us of these kinds of things, for him to repeat himself church. What's the opposite of safe? Dangerous. Yeah, it's dangerous. So Paul's saying, if I don't remind you guys of these things, it's dangerous. Wow. Because most churches, you know, they just want to make you feel good. They just want to, you know, scratch where you're itching, right? They want to make you feel like I, – I've talked to a lot of people. They're like, and I love that church because every time I go there, I feel uplifted. So that means they're going there for an emotional response rather than for hearing from God's word. Now, there's a time and a place, right? There's a season for everything. There's a time and a place to be uplifted, right? Are we against being uplifted? No, definitely not. 
But at the end of the day, I don't think we should ever assume that God only wants us to be uplifted all the time because then we'll be lifted up in pride. And God needs to knock us down a little bit. Imagine you're building a house and you do everything uh, wrong and nothing's according to spec. The building inspector comes and he's like, <laughs> this is a death trap. What are you doing? And you're the contractor and you're like, ah, it looks good to me. It looks great. Yeah, that's your life. So there's a lot of demolition that God has to do in your life where, we ask, where he has to knock things down and then rebuild them the correct way. And so that's not always going to be comfortable. That's not always going to be affirming. But for us to not grasp these points that the Holy Spirit is constantly making, it's dangerous. And we hear that and we read that, but do we actually value God's word enough to put it into practice in our lives? Or are we just hearers of the word and not actually doers of the word? Do we rejoice in the Lord? Do we heed the warnings that God gives us in his word again and again and again? And we see these warnings outlined in verses 3 and following. Take a look at verses 2 and 3. Paul says, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision. He's mutilation, he's talking about the circumcision. He's saying, For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in in the flesh, in our outward appearance. Oh, I'm circumcised. I'm going to heaven. You know, and this kind of sounds kind of sounds quaint because this is not how we look at it anymore. But you have to understand, during that time, there was a group called the Judaizers who were going around and telling the Gentiles that in order to be saved, they need to be circumcised and keep the law and observe Sabbath and not, you know, all these different kinds of things. And it's very easy and therefore very common to be of the mindset that assumes that we're accepted by God by virtue of our performance, by virtue of our good deeds, or by virtue of being born into a Christian family, or being baptized, or taking communion, or as we see here in verse 2 and 3, being circumcised, or whatever. That, yeah, I did it, I checked the box, I am accepted by God now, I get to go to heaven, God is very impressed by me. And that's the concept that here Paul is shooting down. And so this point that Paul is making over and over again that he says is dangerous for us not to grasp is that we shouldn't expect to be accepted by God through some outward effort. Rejoicing in Jesus is what we should be expecting to be accepted by God in. Rejoicing in Jesus, worshiping God in spirit, not trusting in our flesh as though God's impressed by the outward rather than the inward. Jesus says that we need to be born again. That's the Bible's very clear. We need to be born again if we want to be accepted by God. Jesus, when he's speaking to Nicodemus there in John chapter 3, he says, unless a man is born again, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, you will, I guarantee you, if you guys are bold for Christ and out evangelizing, you will meet people who say, oh, I don't believe in that whole born again thing. You know, when we were planting a church in upstate New York, we would hear that very often because that's a predominantly Catholic area, very traditional. Those who aren't Catholic are usually de denominational. There's a lot of Wesleyans. You guys are like, I've never even heard of Wesleyans, let alone met one. But no, there's tons of Wesleyans out there, you know, and when you do meet people who are evangelical, they're usually like Assemblies of God. It's a, it's a very interesting area. And so I would hear very often, oh, I don't believe in that whole born again thing, to which I would respond, well, duh, that's not good because Jesus says, unless you're born again, you're not going to heaven. And you'd be surprised how people's eyes would bug out of their head when they heard that. They never knew that. They just heard the priest stand up front and say, hey, you know, you guys, we don't believe in this whole born again thing. We're, we're saved by, you know, confession and, and attending mass and being confirmed and these kinds of things. And that's what Catholicism absolutely teaches, not debatable. But the Bible's very clear. Jesus is very clear. And he's the one that holds the keys to death and hell. So I think he's the one who gets to decide, right? He, all authority, according to Matthew 28, has been given to him in heaven and on earth. So if we want to know who goes to heaven, we should ask the boss. And Jesus, the boss, says that unless he knows you, unless you're born again, you're not going to heaven. And he makes those rules. And that's what it says. The Bible's very clear. And when we're born again, we can then worship God. We can then love God in spirit 
with childlike faith. And that's a prerequisite. It's not an optional thing. And I didn't say childish faith. It's not childish. It's childlike. Childish is, you know, foolish and, you know, flippant and, and, and not taking things seriously. Childlike faith is that beautiful, simplistic faith that you see where, you know, I, I, I'm reminded of a, of a shirt. It's like a redneck shirt, but it, it sums it up so well. It says, the Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. Well, wow, imagine that, not trying to dance out of what God says. Imagine just taking his word and saying, okay. And where you disagree, you say, well, apparently I was wrong on this matter. Instead of saying, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the Bible away. It's tragic, but I have a friend who I've been pouring into for many, 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 many years. And they had a position that the Bible uh, does not agree with. And they tried to make the case to me for years that the Bible had been changed. And finally, fairly recently, I was able to convince them, no, the Bible hasn't been changed. And they, they're like, I agree, I agree, okay, the Bible hasn't been changed. It's pretty, yeah, it's accurate, we can prove that. And it's demonstrable, it's not up for debate. You know, we have the textual evidence, we have the manuscript evidence, we have everything, it's, it's not really debatable. And that doesn't even get into the equidistant letter sequences and the codes in the Bible that verify the Bible's veracity and everything. But no, I finally was able to convince them of that. And then I was recently talking to them and they said something that was very, very disturbing. I, I wept over it because they finally just came out and said, well, I'm just not a Bible believing Christian. So for years they wanted to act like, yeah, I believe the Bible. I just think it's been changed. And I think the original one was probably good. And I agree with that. But when they found out that their position was anti-biblical and that the Bible hadn't been changed, instead of changing their position, you know what they did? They threw away the Bible. And said to me, I'm just not a Bible-believing Christian. Few things are more terrifying than that. That's the, that's the epitome of pride. That's the epitome of, I know best. And then I would say that person's no longer a Christian. Their religion is themselves. They're the final arbiter of faith, of, of truth, of everything, right? And so it's no longer, you know, Christianity, it's Jasonism or, you know, Steveism or whatever, because you're the ultimate decider of what's real and what's not. No longer God's word, which Jesus says, sanctify them by your word, your word is truth. You know, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says the scriptures, the holy scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation and that they're useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. And when we don't believe that because it doesn't fit our positions and we throw it out, we throw it away, then my goodness, we've gone off the deep end. We are no longer biblical Christians. We're no longer walking with the Lord. We're no longer having that childlike faith. We're no longer rejoicing in Christ. It's a terrifying thing. Our flesh wants to rejoice not in Christ, but in the temporary victories, the temporary pleasures of this life. And not that those things are necessarily bad. You know, God made food taste good because he's nice, right? He made marriage enjoyable because he's nice. He, he could have, like, when the curse happened, he could have just made all that stuff terrible. Imagine having to eat, you know, food twice a day and all the food tastes like liver, chopped liver or something. People are like, some people are like, I love liver. Like, you're weird. That's cool. You can be weird. Right? We have the freedom to be weird. But at the end of the day, God's gracious, right? He gave us, like, uh, we, I, we had some strawberries the other day, and they were just so perfect, where it's like, oh, my gosh, these strawberries are amazing. God's gracious, right? So these things aren't bad. It's not bad to have temporary pleasure in the temporal stuff, right? But that's not the end all, be all of this life. That's not where our focus should be. That's not where our heart should be. So not rejoicing in the earthly reality of the day to day, but instead rejoicing in Jesus, that Jesus loves us, that Jesus saves us, that we're accepted in the beloved that our names are written in heaven. You know, we think when Jesus sends out the 70 and they come back and they're like, what? Even the demons obey us. It's crazy. And Jesus says, don't rejoice in that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Guys, we get to go to heaven. God's forgiven us of our sins that we deserve hell for. How amazing is that? Imagine you're in court and you've just been sentenced to life in prison, no parole. 
And then the judge takes off his robe, steps down from the bench and says, I'm taking this punishment upon myself. And not only that, but here's the keys to my house, the keys to my Porsche. Go enjoy this incredible reward. I've forgiven you. I love you. I'm going to take it upon myself. Uh, but I got all green lights on the way to class. And that's what Satan's like. Rejoice in that. Get on that trip to D. De- get on the airplane to Detroit. It's first class. Don't get on the plane to Maui. You have to fly a coach. That's uncomfortable. And the Chinese underground church gets that, right? That's why they call this life the kingdom of preparation. And they call the next life the kingdom of inheritance. Because they're getting their organs removed without anesthesia. And to them, it's very real. To us, it's like, wow, I live in America. This is nice. Yeah, well, this is an illusion. This is a test. And God's totally fair, and he's reaching out to everyone. But at the end of the day, this is your test. Are you going to focus on this, the matrix? Or are you going to live reality and realize that this is all a test under the sun and that we're playing, we're battling for keeps? Souls hang in the balance. You guys have the tickets to heaven. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that you guys are the ambassadors for God, pleading with men, be reconciled to God. We're not here on vacation. We always make the analogy that this life is not a cruise ship. It is a battleship. It is not a playground. It is a battleground. And Satan wants nothing more than to get you to rejoice in things that don't matter. Because then you will live a life that don't matter. And it's working incredibly successfully. It's tragic. And so when this is where our mind is at, this is where our heart is at, that we won't have confidence in the flesh, but in the Son of God who loves us and gave himself for us. What's more freeing than that? Why would we want to add anything to that? Who do you think would want us to add something to that? Who do you think would want us to see ourselves as justified by our performance or our works or our position or our status or our pedigree or that we were circumcised rather than through faith in Jesus Christ? It takes the burden off of me when I trust in Jesus Christ for my righteousness. It takes the burden off of me and it puts it onto Jesus Christ who says, come to me all you who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He wants us to cast our cares upon him. He wants us to find our righteousness in him. We're effectively stealing when we take that back and say, well, no, no, I got this, Lord. I'll I'll be accepted in my own righteousness. And like we always talk about, you want to see how that works? Read the end of the Bible where it says, all those who are judged according to their works are thrown into the lake of fire. You can't be good enough. There is no good enough except Jesus. He was the only one who's good enough. Like we just sang in this song, he's the only one who's worthy to open the seals and unbreak, to break the seals and open the scroll. And John, the revelator, right? John, the apostle in Revelation, he realizes that no one's worthy to do that. And he starts weeping convulsively because he recognizes that we are in a bad place until he sees the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb as though it's been slain, as though the lamb as it were slain, open the scroll, break the seals. And we're going to be seeing that very shortly from the mezzanine at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But it takes the burden off of me and puts it onto Jesus Christ. Only Jesus is good enough. And knowing that is freeing. It takes the burden off of us. And then when that happens, guys, we worship God, we worship Jesus in spirit. Instead of just this outward mechanical, I hope I'm trying hard enough, I hope I'm doing good enough, I better be born again, again, again. I better recommit. I better go get baptized. I better do it all again. Because we didn't do good enough the first time. It depends on us. Oh my gosh, I'm not doing good enough. I better do it again. But when we just trust in Jesus and look to him for our righteousness, it frees us from that. And then we can worship Jesus and adore Jesus in spirit and in truth, just knowing that he's good enough and he loves us, that we're accepted in the beloved. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's not about me or about how awesome I am or how I've been circumcised or whatever, you know. And Paul fleshes that out in verses four through seven. Take a look at verses four through seven. We'll start to bring it all together. And Paul says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, 
If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul's like, you guys think you're doing good? You think you got something to impress God with? Yeah, no, definitely not. And obviously we don't have all the, we don't all have the pedigree, we don't all have the resume of Paul the Apostle, but the takeaway from what Paul is saying here is still the same, guys. It's that we need to, like Paul, recognize that those things that were gained to us, we've counted loss for Christ. That's the same takeaway. Whether you are impressive or, you know, whether you were a blue blood born in a mansion where your parents were tutoring you with other languages and piano or whether you grew up in a trailer eating cheese whiz, it's the same thing. God's not impressed either way. The world has nothing to offer you. You, you have nothing to offer God. And the sooner you realize that, the better off you'll be. This world will leave you empty. The world can never satisfy, never fulfill you. And we see this illustrated in the lives of the rich and famous, right? Rich and famous people, they're super happy, right? No, they have the highest suicide rates. Their lives are terrible. They're not happy. You know, you guys have all seen it, whether it be the sports guy who just won the Super Bowl or, you know, the Olympian who just won the gold medal or the, you know, the actor who's on top of his, in, you know, in the top of his game in Hollywood or, the, you know, whatever it is. You talk to all these people, you look at their interviews and they're just like, yeah, I'm empty. This life is meaningless. None of this makes me happy. I don't care about any of this stuff. I just wish I was happy. My life is empty. Yeah, this world will never satisfy you. It makes, it reminds me of, a, I think it was Rockefeller. At the peak of his fame, it might have been J.P. Morgan, I think it was Rockefeller, they interviewed him and they said to him, when he was the richest man in the world at the time, he was like, you know, the Jeff Bezos, the Bill Gates, and they said to him, how much money will be enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. I told you guys about the guy I personally know well, and I, you know, I look at his life and he's worth $300 million, and what's he do? He gets up every day and goes to work. Like, what are you doing? Go, go spend money and enjoy yourself. No, nothing makes you happy. Nothing makes you happy. You know, we uh, live out in the middle of nowhere on top of a mountain, so right now the hunters are everywhere. And it's hilarious because you look at them, and, you know, they always have the excuse, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hunting because I, I, I need to get some meat to fill my freezer. And you look, and they are driving by in their $120,000 pickup truck with a $40,000 side-by-side being towed on a $10,000 trailer, with their $2,000 worth of hunting uh, camo and the top end stuff, and they're carrying a $3,000 custom rifle with the $2,000 custom scope. Tell me again how you're just trying to fill your freezer. Yeah, no, what you're doing is you're trying to be cool. You're trying to find some meaning, some purpose in all this stuff that is truly purposeless, that's truly meaningless. The richest man who ever lived wrote a book. It's called the Book of Ecclesiastes. You know what he says? It's all vanity. It's all vanity. It's all pointless under the sun. And he finishes the book by saying, you know what's important? Seek God, fear God, and keep his commandments. Yeah, that's the reality of the situation. None of this stuff's going to make you happy. God often has this way of giving us these things that we think we want, that we think will make us happy. Like the Bible says in, um, I think it's Stephen when he's recounting the trips, the journeys of Israel through the wilderness. He talks about how God gave them the desires of their heart, but sent leanness into their souls. He'll give you the desires of your heart and send leanness into your soul. None of that stuff will make you happy. The thing that you think will make you happy, it won't make you happy. Because there's a a God-shaped hole in your heart, and only God can fill that hole. Only God can scratch where you're itching. And the sooner you realize that, the better. Because then you'll start living the life that God has for you. And he made you. He knows how to satisfy you. Just like you guys who have a dog, you know how to make your dog's leg shake, right? You scratch that little certain spot, and the dog's like, "Ah, ah, you know. God knows how to make you happy. God knows how to do that with you. God knows what is going to satisfy you. And it's not the thing that you think will satisfy you. 
you know, I've talked about before how there's this video, you probably, some of you guys probably seen it, where this mom is sitting there cutting onions and the baby's convinced it's an apple. And so the whole time the baby's like, apple, 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 apple. Mom just finally hands the baby the onion. And the baby's like, eh, not apple. Yeah, that's you. That's me. When we think we know what's going to make us happy in this life. And God's like, there you go, genius. And you're just like, it's not an apple. Yeah, it never was an apple. You thought it was. It wasn't. God tried to warn you in his word. You didn't listen. And that's often what we see because this life can't fulfill you. But Satan tries to convince you to set your heart on these things, knowing it will make you depressed and ineffective as a Christian, knowing that it'll compromise your witness, making you not even want to preach Christ to those that God has in your life that he wants to use you to reach. Because once your witness is compromised, you're like, oh, man, I can't say this. These people know that I'm a fraud. Sometimes Satan will remind you guys of how invested you are. Oh, you can't stop now. You've put years into this. You've built your whole identity around this. How will you explain it to your friends and family? Everyone will think you're crazy. They'll say you're being dramatic or irresponsible or too radical or that God isn't really showing you to just walk away from this. And tragically, more often than not, Satan's actually successful in convincing Christians not to do what God shows them to do. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this, how many times Pastor Steve has seen this, and the incredible destruction that comes from this, not just in the lives of the people that this happens to, but even in the lives of those around them, the churches that they attend or whatever else, where they serve, whatever it is. Because it's easier. It's expedient. And it's what you already wanted to do anyways. Remember the satanic commandments, just do whatever you want. Yeah, do whatever you want. That's the whole of the law. Just do what you want. Have it your way, right? Just do it. From what we've experienced, about 90 to 95% of the time, Satan's able to not only convince people not to do what God told them to do, but even to convince them that it's the godly thing to do. They'll find some way, because you're smart, you're pretty smart. You'll find some way to couch this thing that's the opposite of what God told you to do. You'll find some way to couch it in spiritual terms. Well, you know, the Lord really put it on my heart. You know, there's just this. this. You know, I just really feel like the Lord wants me to, you know, just. And then it becomes like Charlie Brown. This means nothing. You've convinced yourself, but God's up there like, no, nope. I'll tell you about it when you get here. We use the teleological ethic instead of the deontological ethic. And I don't mean to glaze you guys' eyes over with the big words, but these words are important. Teleo means distance. Deontological, that's the duty-based ethic. You're doing the right thing because God told you to do it. That's the ethic we're supposed to have as Christians. God said it, I'm doing it. Remember that shirt we were talking about? Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. That's the ethic God wants us to have. Whereas Satan, he's like, no, you should have a teleological ethic, the distance-based ethic. The ends justifies the means. The Bible says, should we do evil that good may abound? God forbid. That's literally what the verse says, right? But the world tries to convince us to have this teleological-based ethic. Well, you know, it's, yeah, you know, it's wrong that you do this. But, you know, I mean, at the end, it's the, for the greater good. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. But they're your intentions. And God's never told us to do the thing that we think will be the best. Because do we know better or does God know better? What he tells us to do is toe the line. He's God, you're not. Do what he said. It's that simple. And people are like, mm, yeah, 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 I don't like that. Yeah, yeah, I re- actually, I really don't like that. Oh, die to self? <laughs> yeah, you die. That's what they did to him, right? And they crucified the, the king of glory. And we're still crucifying him. And again, instead of crucifying our lives and living the crucified life and laying down our life and picking up our cross daily and following him, because it's easier to throw God under the bus And to use Christian terminology to convince people that we're doing these things for the righteous motivations, even though it's the exact opposite of what the Bible said to do. I've seen men destroy churches. And then when asked about it, well, you know, the Bible said to do this, but I couldn't do that. You know, I couldn't, it just wouldn't have worked. I couldn't do it. So I just, you know, I just, I I burned the church down. (laughs) You get to heaven and God's like, so what did you do to build my kingdom? I burnt down a church. Fantastic. Satan was very pleased. And yet that's what we do. Think back to Eve in the garden. What did the serpent say? Hath God really said? 
And Satan's still saying that same thing today, whispering it in the ears of Christians who are willing to do it. Because the last thing Satan wants you to do is to lay down your life, to actually live for Jesus, to actually be more than just a Sunday morning Christian, to not just believe in Jesus, but like Paul here, to count everything as lost for Christ. And our enemy is subtle. And the way he convinces us to disobey God is just like in the garden. And so he'll cast doubt on God's word, and very often he'll appeal to our pride. Paul, you know, Paul, you trained under Gamaliel, man. You can't, you can't just walk away from that, man. You're like, you're in line to be like the top Pharisee, Paul. Like, what are you doing, man? You can't, you can't just walk away from that. That would be crazy. You got a great career in front of you, man. You, you can't just throw all that away because you think God is telling you to. You can't just walk away from your degree. You can't, you can't just walk away from your career. You can't just walk away from, you can't just walk away. You can't just, you can't, you can't walk away. You know, and that's what Satan does. When my wife got saved, she was one test. She just had to do a test. Very easy to do. Nothing difficult. She just had to do a test to get her diploma. That's all. And she would have had her master's in international finance from a great business school in France and been all ready to conquer the world. And she became a Christian and God told her not to do it. And she was praying and she's like, Lord, should I finish my college? Because my parents will be very upset if I don't. And the Lord spoke to her and showed her a verse that says, you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and the God of money. So my wife went and took the test anyways because, no, she didn't take the test. Do you think she regrets that now? You think she's like, wow, I should have took the test. But that's what most people do, right? And that's exactly what Paul did, right? Paul walked away too. Paul did the same thing. He walked away. He's like, yeah, no. I'm, I trained under Gamaliel. You know, I'm at the, at the feet of the, the greatest teacher in Israel. And my, my future is probably that of the chief, rabbin, chief, uh, tree, chief Pharisee or whatever. And Paul threw all it away. He counted it loss for Christ. And do you think Paul regretted that in eternity, church? Do you think Paul was like, darn it? I should have been the chief Pharisee. If we live this life for Christ, do you think we'll regret that in eternity? If we burn down our lives around Jesus, do you think you'll regret that in eternity? Do you think you'll regret what you gave up for Christ or what you refused to give up for Christ? What do you think? Because the Bible tells us to lay down our lives, that we're dead in Christ. Our lives are hidden in Christ in God, Colossians 3.3 3 tells us, right? We're supposed to pick up our cross daily and follow Jesus, living the crucified life, not doing our own thing, but doing what the Lord tells us to do. You think you'll regret doing what God tells you to do or not doing what God tells you to do in light of eternity? We sang it this morning, right? Is he worthy? And the trajectory of your life will answer that question. Is he worthy? You're answering that question every single day with your life. Is he worthy? He is. So let's worship him in spirit and not just outwardly. Let's rejoice in Jesus and not just, you know, in things that don't matter in light of eternity. And let's find our acceptance, our confidence in Jesus and our relationship with him through faith rather than in our own performance or ability or pedigree or whatever. And let's count all the things of this world, all the things of this life, loss for Christ and for the joy and the hope and the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you are so good. Lord, your word is truth, Lord, and we rejoice in you, Lord Jesus. And we we pray that you would give us the strength to cast off all these things that so easily ensnare us, Lord, and to run this race that you've set before us, Lord, keeping our eyes fixed on you, the author and finisher of our faith, Lord Jesus. So strengthen us, Lord, and give us the perspective to see these things that are holding us back, the things that we're rejoicing in, Lord, the things that we're taking confidence in that are exalting themselves against you. Because, Lord, we don't want to be ashamed when we enter eternity. Lord, we want to run this race with endurance. Lord, we want to be bold for you. We want to lay down these things that you're telling us to lay down. And we want to pick up our cross and follow you. So, Lord, strengthen us to do this. Give us perspective. Give us wisdom. 
Fill us with your spirit and empower us to do this, Lord Jesus. Help us to finish strong, Lord Jesus. And we pray that you'd bless the time of fellowship that we're going to have now. In Jesus' name.